morning, everyone, and welcome to my presentation, Stay Out of the Fire, Negotiation of Meanings by Positioning in MMRPGs. Um, let's start with a ready check before we continue with the question what meaning negotiation and positioning are. So first I will talk about, very briefly, about my methods and data I used for the research. I will then talk about communication in MMRPGs. I will then introduce you to negotiation and the positioning theory. Then I will talk about gamer positioning in-game. There I will show you some examples from my data and what this looks like in-game. And finally, there will be a conclusion and time for questions. Okay, are you ready? Let's begin. So, for my, data, for my research I used two data sets. An uh, online questionnaire, which consisted of um, three question sets. It was a self-selected survey in the gamer community, so everyone who wanted to participate could participate. There was no artificial sample applied. And 324 gamers from 42 countries participated in this survey and answered questions from three question sets, the gamer profile, the gaming behavior, and the language behavior. The second data source is a corpus, um, a self-compiled corpus consisting of chat logs and message board messages from the official game message boards. Um, I used it for qualitative data, so as a vivid repository of real and contextualized language. The main data here comes from World of Warcraft and Lord of the Rings Online. But what does communication in MMORPGs mean? First of all, for those who are maybe not familiar with the gaming genre, MMORPG stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Games, like World of Warcraft, and in these games, a large amount of gamers play together online and they assume roles like warriors and mages. What makes communication in MMORPG so special is its hybrid character. The communication forms as such are not new. The chat channels in-game are like chat rooms, whispering is like instant messaging, there are message boards, let's play videos and Wikipedias. That's not new as such but they are uniquely combined in MMORPGs. Each communication form has its, uh, provides technical particularities which have to be dealt with, like the aspect of direction, so if it's one-to-one -one communication, like in instant messaging, or if it's one-to-many communication, like in chat rooms. Then the aspect of time, so if it's synchronous, like chats, or asynchronous, like message boards and of course the issue of privacy. Each has its pros and cons um, concerning communication. And then there are of course communicative challenges which influence the way gamers communicate. In face-to-face -face communication we have paralinguistic cues like facial expressions, gestures or the sound of the voice which help us make meaning and communicate. But these features are missing in MMORPGs or in um, communication online in general. Another factor is that gamers come from different cultural and language backgrounds. And many of them are forced to play the game in English while this is not their mother tongue. This makes English for many gamers a lingua franca. And as my research shows, not all gamers are equally proficient in English. So this is also a challenge gamers face. Another important factor is that gamers are in high stress situations. In-game encounters are complex, they can be attention demanding and a matter of in-game life or death. And these challenges have to be met in communication. Then there are also influencing aspects. There are three driving aspects in MMORPGs which are closely rela related to one another the social aspects, cooperation, and achievement and progression. They are linked in a vicious circle, since in order to um, progress in the game, the gamer has to achieve something like fulfill quests, but to do this, he or she has to improve his or her character and um, in-game by reaching higher levels or getting better gear. 
and in order to progress, the gamer will sooner or later need the help of other gamers because the quests become more challenging. So the gamers have to cooperate and interact and play together with another to achieve something. The experiences, the challenges, the failing and the success weld the gamers together and um, create friendships, deepens existing ones, and they create also speech communities with strong ties, which highlights also the social aspects of these games, which function as, a, as one of the strong motivations to play such games. As my research showed, many gamers play MMORPGs especially for these social aspects because they want to interact with others, they want to play together, want to play with friends and spend time. The social aspects can also be seen in the communication forms and channels provided to the gamers. Clearly for some gamers, uh, achievements in-game um, such as improving and bringing to perfection one's character is more important than, for example, role-playing, exploring and, and creating uh, characters with background stories. Yet the social and cooperative component is part of all these gaming motivations. Achievements on higher levels can only be achieved with the help of others in the end game and in order to improve one's character one will need maybe resources other gamers can offer. And of course, role-playing is um, more exciting if there is someone to perform to. But what does negotiation and position, positioning mean? In my research, I use the positioning theory, which is a concept in psychology, but is also commonly used in other disciplines under different names. In essence, whenever we talk to one another, we take a position in the conversation at hand, because we want to achieve a particular effect in the other. As Harry and Mogadam call it, position is a cluster of rights and duties to perform certain actions. For them and other scholars, a position is a certain place in a hierarchical setting, or as they refer to it, a storyline, like being a judge in the storyline of a court trial. I would define position as a place in social space, um, in relation to other people. Therefore, the focus is not on the, the situation, but on the underlying motivation and the perlocutionary effect the speakers want to achieve, rather than the social conventions and rules and duties which are applied to a situation. So, quite similar to what uh, this quote by Widdowson says, I believe that every sort of discourse involves interpersonal um, positioning for a particular effect. But what does that actually mean? Um, positioning is always active and it's always relational. Just like we heard in the keynote before, making meaning is always an active, it's a process. And we have to actively um, be involved in this. We position ourselves in relation to others and re in return the interlocutor um, positions in relation to us. So an action always causes a reaction and it's similar like a dance. The movement of one dancer leads the other dancers also to move. And the moves of the other dancers, again, lead me to move. So if a speaker speaks, um, it uh, influences the other speakers and their um, meaning making and their positioning. Um, also crucially, like dancing and communication, it's always um, a matter of cooperation to some extent. It's always a give and take, so the speakers have to cooperate to some extent. And this is sometimes also referred to as the imperatives. In different um, disciplines, two positions can be determined. So on one hand, we have cooperation, then in linguistics, in politeness theory, it's called positive phase, it's also called involvement and approach. On the other hand, we have territoriality, the negative phase, independence or withdrawal. The um, involvement, positive phase and approach refer to the desire of humans to be appreciated, to be involved with others and to be liked. While the negative phase, independence and withdrawal, refer to our desire to be independent, to be free, and to be not 
uh, to be unimpeded by others. So on one hand, humans seek in communication um, a familiarity and involvement with others. At the same time, we also want to keep our privacy and be secure in our territory. Um, these two aspects are very essential to human communication and influence our positioning in communication up subconsciously. Clearly, these two desires cannot be fulfilled at the same time completely, so it's always a balancing act which desire we follow more in communication. But what are positioning moves? I'm talking about positioning all the time, but what is this? Positioning can be everything. It can be an utterance, it can be a nod, it can be a glance. So everything we, um, signal, we, we um, provide others as signals in interaction. And these moves um, partly are, um, we, we make these moves partly at the same time. So we can also claim sympathy and build rapport, evoke closeness, put ourselves in the in-group, but at the same time, of course, we can also try to put ourselves outside the group and make us the other, because we maybe don't want to be part of the, of the in-group. Just like in the talk we heard yesterday when gamers said it, don't refer to themselves as gamers, so they put themselves outside this group. That was quite a lot of theory, but what does this look like in in-game situations? I start with an easy example, with a looking for group sequence. So here, um, a gamer is looking for a group to damage dealer and a healer for the raid night hold in World of Warcraft. Um, compared to the acronymic form here, the the um, the, the description is quite long-winded. So um, acronyms function as a as a as a serve the function of efficiency. They make communication fast and um, efficient. As my um, participant said, um, it's for them the preferred way um, for looking for others for help in the game. So 79% of the gamers said that acronymic LFG sequences are appropriate to um, look for help. As I said, it's efficient and fast and provides the gamer with the exact quest objective. So, and also with the, uh, what is expected of them. So it's clear that here two damage dealers are needed and a healer and not a tank. And it's, a, uh, it's going to night hold and not to another raid dungeon. Um, but acronyms and also neologisms in that matter do not only speed up communication and make it more efficient, but they can also function as um, as marker of the in-group and as and help gamers to position as part of the community. On one hand, because they use them. On the other hand, because they understand them. So if a gamer doesn't know what DD means, would you take somebody like that into a raid? Not likely, because then the gamer is exposed as a noob and you wouldn't take a noob into a raid like that. I mean, that would be... Stupid. <laughs> so in-group markers uh, like acronyms and neologisms allow the gamers to separate the weed from the chef, the pros from the noobs. When you are ended up in a group, it can happen that things get tense. Like here, oh my God, stay out of the fire, you, well. And this is a good example of a flame. So the, the open um, insult and, and offending of another person. And normally there's a reason for a flame, even if it's not clear at first glance, but there is a certain reason. But why does staying in the fire cause flaming? Because when there is an area of effect spell on the ground, you should really run out of it fast, because otherwise you die. Because such effects on the ground, like a fire, cause huge damage to you. And if this happens, you slow down the group because you died and they are one member short. Or it can even happen that the whole group dies. That they wipe. And um, because the healer maybe um, tried to heal you and the attention was taken away from the others. And this can, of course, lead to another flame. 
Learn to play for fucking sake, noob slash kick. Based on my research, only 10 out of 324 gamers claimed to flame other group members because they caused a wipe. Most gamers stated to use other strategies in such problematic situations, like this one here. It's okay to make mistake, we all do, but you have to learn from it and take advice from us more experienced player who are successful in here. So one last chance where you either do what we say or I'll kick you out, I'm afraid. So here the participant of my survey claims common ground with the other gamer by saying that we are all doing mistakes, that it's okay to make them if the lesson is learned, and that this praise is minimized by the use of smileys. This is also quite common to use smileys to downtone negative emotions and to, to take away a bit of the, the tension in, a, in such a problematic situation. So the gamer is shown a certain amount of appreciation um, and the participant tries to negotiate and manipulate the gamer towards a desired outcome. So that would be to follow their advice and do what they tell him to do and not cause other unnecessary wipes. But the participant at the same time also positions at the, as the authority of the group issuing an ultimatum so if the other gamer does not follow the advice, he or she will be removed from the group. So in this example, we can see that several positions are taken at the same time and several signals sent. So you can, at one hand, um, show appreciation and, and deal with the positive face also of the other gamer by showing appreciation and that he or she is still liked to some extent. At the other hand, you can also at the same time also um, refer to the negative phase, so to the, um, also to the desire of you to be unimpeded and have your security. Why do gamers use such strategies and go to such lengths in such situations? My research shows that um, it's rather an egocentric motivation. If you insult another gamer you're questing with, he or she might snap and leave the group altogether, and this would leave the group one member short and uh, slow down the whole group or even prevent the success of the undertaking. So therefore it is better to use strategies to get the other gamer to do what you want him or her to do. So as some um, of my participants say, talk the other gamer around. It's also better, as some gamers said, for the whole group if there isn't um, uh, flaming because it demotivates also the other gamers if there is too much tension. The positions in such situations are clear. There is an aim, the finishing of an encounter, um, which you want to achieve. But why do gamers um, troll others or gank? Ganking is the repeatedly killing of other gamers even if they just are resurrected. So why position outside of the group? Why not um, be part of the group? Why cause harm? And here's an example of trolling. Looking for people for my guild, no gnomes. They are the worst players ever and cause me eye cancer. Well, so here a gamer wants to provoke by excluding a game race because they are, according to him or her, bad players and cause eye cancer. And this statement led to a long and heated discussion in the chat channels in-game. Um, if, if a gaming race is an indicator for uh, and quality marker for gaming skill, if this is even a racist comment, if this is okay or not. Trolling is a negative communication practice and it should provoke others um, and offend them for one's own amusement. So in this incident, the troll did not partake in the discussion at all anymore and obviously just watched amused. It appears that such negative practices are not just positioning of the other gamers, uh, not positioning of the gamer as such, the troll and the ganker, but rather a forced positioning of the other gamers. So the other gamers are um, put, put into the position of the victim. When it comes to trolling, the gamer is positioned uh, as a victim of defamation and mockery. When it comes to ganking, um, you're forced into suffering, frustration and demotivation 
Because if you're killed over and over again, that's really demotivating and frustrating. And obviously, um, this forced positioning in which you are powerless um, gives the troll and the ganker a position of power and a satisfaction and amusement, obviously. No wonder that one of the best strategies against forced positioning is not to let yourself be positioned in such a way. To, um, because positions, as I said, are dynamic and can be changed throughout an interaction. So don't feed the troll, stay cool, and don't uh, give the other gamer the satisfaction of your victimization. I guess I'm rather fast already, <laughs> so let's come to the conclusion. Um, what this presentation hopefully showed in a very brief and concise um, amount is that communication in game, but also outside the game, is always a matter of negotiating positions. These positions are dynamic and complex. We gamers, we communicators, um, do not act and communicate other in game than outside the game. Yes, trolling, flaming, and ganking exist. And many feel, especially also of my participants, feel that the MMORPG's um, surrounding is more hostile than real life. But if you think of traffic and how um, drivers flame each other or maybe sometimes cause dangerous situation, situations out of rage, it shows that flaming is not really a and phenomenon of in-game incidents. And if you ever tried to buy something before a holiday at the supermarket, <laughs> you realize that ganking is a picnic compared to shopping for groceries before a holiday. In the end, we are always humans and we have the same needs and desires in-game as outside the games. We want to be appreciated, we want to be independent, and these two desires cannot be fulfilled at the same time. Hence, we're always balancing our needs and those of, of the interlocutors um, in order to have successful and satisfying communication and in-game encounters with hopefully epic loot. And I hope that this presentation gave you a small glimpse at linguistics and communication in-game. I thank you for your attention. And one last advice, don't stand in fire. Thank you. <laughs>